Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, now we will formally begin our uh, memorial lecture. So before that, I would like to welcome everyone. And I would like to invite our uh, speakers today to kindly come up on dais. I would like to invite Dr. Ahmad Abdul Hai, uh, who is the director of Paris Hospitals, to kindly come and uh, come on the dais. I would uh, request Professor Arun Kamal, uh, who is a poet and winner of the Sahitya Academy Award and a retired professor of Patna University, to kindly come on the dais. And next, uh, I would uh, request our speaker for today, Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who is Lawrence Sells Rockefeller Visiting Professor Princeton uh, and a senior fellow at Center for Policy Research, New Delhi, to kindly come on the dais. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to see such an august gathering, not only on the dais, but also among the audience. We have people from diverse disciplines uh, who are well-established, reputed people in their fields, be it health, politics, economics, political science. Uh, this is a true mix of uh, the audience at Adri that we always uh, had, and we really, really appreciate all of you taking out uh, your time and coming and listening to the lecture uh, today. Also, uh, this is the third Shaibal Gupta Memorial Lecture, and uh, while um, organizing these lectures, uh, what we keep in mind are a few things. First, uh, we, we, through these lectures, we want to at least maintain some of the spirit uh, with which uh, the, my father, on whom uh, this memorial lecture is dedicated to, envisaged uh, about Adri and uh, the work that he did throughout his life. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, choosing or selecting speakers, the primary thing that, of course, uh, all of them have are, are uh, superstars in their field. The first lecture was given by Professor Abhijit Banerjee on history. Uh, the second was by Professor Koshik Basu, who talked about technology and labor. And third is by Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who is going to talk about democracy. All these people are stalwarts in their own field, and they, they have spoken about topics which are very relevant and topical, uh, uh, and um, they are extremely important to be discussed uh, given our political as well as social situations. But uh, I think uh, from, from our perspective, the primary uh, reason that we select these speakers are or uh, my first criteria is uh, that the speaker would be someone whom my father would really enjoy listening to. And um, <clears throat> when I'm standing here in this hall, I can really feel his presence. And I hope that uh, <laughs> he is also around listening to um, the excellent lecture and also the discussion that, uh, that, uh, that we hope to have with all of you. Um, now, I'll not go into uh, formal introductions, but I'll just briefly talk about Dr. Shaibal Gupta, who was a leading social scientist from Bihar. I know in this audience, um, they, most of you would be knowing, but uh, there are at least some of you who would have come for the first time, or uh, um, so for them. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview that he primarily uh, focused uh, his entire life's work on understanding uh, 
what are the reasons for underdevelopment of Bihar in particular and Hindi heartland in general. His passion was Bihar and he was deeply committed to the betterment of the state, which is why he chose to live and work from Bihar in spite of getting opportunities from all across the world. And uh, keeping with that spirit, uh, I think uh, one, of the, uh, one of the main uh, things that we try to do is hold the lectures in Patna every year and try to get world-class scholars to come to Patna uh, and, and to interact with this vibrant uh, audience that Patna has. Also, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the pioneering work that Adri and my father did was to follow an interdisciplinary approach to understanding social sciences wherein um, he always believed that economics requires a deeper understanding of history, sociology, anthropology, as well as politics. In, unless one has this uh, well-dimensioned, well-rounded philosophy, um, you do not understand the true nature of um, any social science. So uh, without uh, much... Um, in taking much of your time. I'll just uh, say a brief few lines about Professor Mehta. Of course, like every, uh, I have spoken to most of you over the phone by inviting you, and as soon as I say that it's Professor Mehta who's going to talk, he doesn't need any introduction. Everybody has either read his uh, articles in Indian Express or know about his scholarship. Uh, but he has, uh, I would just, um, just again, um, I would like to briefly emphasize some of uh, his, uh, uh, very briefly, uh, some of his accolades. One of them being that uh, he is a visiting professor at Center for Human Values at Princeton University and also at the Center for Policy Research in Delhi. He was the, previously the vice chancellor of Ashoka University. And he has taught in many universities across the world, uh, uh, for example, Harvard, Ashoka, JNU, as well as NYU. Uh, he has done his PhD in politics from Princeton, and he was the first cohort of graduate student fellows at the Center for Human Values. He has, of course, a wide range of publications to his credit, um, and has won many awards, but one of the notable awards is the Infosys Prize that he won in 2011, and uh, the citation uh, of that award, uh, uh, which was written by the jury uh, chaired, chaired by Professor Amar Tesen, and that kind of read, Dr. Pratab Hanu Mehta has established himself as one of India's finest scholars and public minds who has inspired a new generation of intellectual inquiry. Uh, so we are all eager to hear him today. Uh, chairing the session today is our uh, Professor Arun Kamal, who is our very own professor of um, English from the Department of uh, Patna University. He retired in 2019. He's a very eminent poet and has been felicitated with the Sahitya Academy Award in 1998. Our chief guest for this evening is Dr. Hai, who is again a very renowned person in his own field. We all know him as one of the best doctors, a researcher in medical sciences, but um, what the, we also came to know of our recent interactions with him is he's also a very, he has a keen interest in uh, social sciences, in, in many social activities. He has won several awards for his philanthropic as well as uh, social activities. Um, <clears throat> and he's also someone who has a keen interest in research. So given our topic, I thought that this group of people would be the ideal group who would uh, bring into bringing more uh, value and flavor to the discussion. And without much more, taking much more time, I now invite Professor Mehta to deliver the third Shaibal Gupta Memorial Lecture. Over to you, Professor Mehta. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, Professor Kamal, Dr. Hai, uh, members of the audience. Uh, needless to say, uh, one wish this such a lecture weren't necessary. Sherba left us too soon. And frankly, for the academic world outside Patna, Patna and Bihar was Shaibal Gupta. I mean, uh, I, I've had a long academic career. I have not encountered uh, anyone who combined the exemplary qualities of a scholar, a human being, an institution builder, a citizen, uh, as profoundly uh, and as deeply as Shaival Gupta did. Um, I have perhaps visited Patna three or four times. Uh, it was always an education to be in his presence. Uh, and he had a kind of gentle pedagogy about him. I think most of you will kind of remember having conversation with him with, in very subtle ways. He would critique you, get you to see points that you had never thought of before. Uh, he was an extraordinarily original, uh, extraordinarily original mind. When I was thinking about the topic of today's lecture, what might be appropriate, uh, two thoughts came to mind. One was actually personal, which was the last time I actually spoke in Shaibal Gupta's presence. He, he actually rebuked me uh, gently and subtly for not giving a lecture that was actually academic. He, in fact, he reminded one that academic should uh, not, in a sense, second guess audiences. And, 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 and this, in a sense, is going to be a tribute to him by being an academic lecture, at least as far as possible. But more substantively, I think one of the things that made him such a remarkable scholar uh, and a remarkable institution builder uh, an engaged citizen, was he was one of the few intellectuals in the Indian pantheon who could operate at many registers simultaneously. Uh, he could be a technocrat when he wanted, reeling off statistics of you know, federal devolution to Bihar and interstate allocations. Uh, people often forget uh, he was a brilliant theoretician of social movements, and one of his abiding interests was actually radical democracy. Um, uh, he wrote very interestingly about Marx and democracy, for example. Um, and one of the thought things I thought I would do today, and that's in a sense the title of the subject uh, of, of today's topic, the crisis of liberal democracy in, in, rep in comparative perspective is to actually return to some of the foundational questions that I think Scheibel asked during much of his career and wrote about uh, and spoke about very deeply and profoundly. Uh, but some of those questions, I think, I think in his later work, you know, I think partly the pressures of running Adri, partly I think uh, in a sense the challenges of managing um, uh, state and administration in Bihar uh, perhaps somewhat obscured. And so this is to bring out Shaival, the social theorist in some ways, uh, the grand social theorist that he in fact was. Now, it is taken for granted, I think, in discussions these days, that this is a moment for, of crisis in liberal democracies the world over. Uh, you can dispute many measures of this crisis. Uh, people often talk about all the kind of international indexes, Freedom House, Weedem. Uh, and certainly many of those indexes have deep methodological flaws. But I think there is consensus amongst scholars, certainly, that we are living in an era of what is known as democratic erosion, if not democratic backsliding. And by the way, this democratic erosion and democratic backsliding is pretty much characteristic all across the world. If you look at the VDEM index of the health of democracies, India is still scoring very high on electoral democracy. Uh, our elections are still contested, they're quite robust in some ways. And yet, almost on all other measures of democracy, freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of association, institutional health, India is slipping. But by the way, so are 79 other democracies, including the United States of America. 
right? Uh, uh, so that anybody who says these indexes are a Western conspiracy to malign India, actually they're even more severe on many of the Western democracies. And the standard symptoms of democratic erosion are pretty much similar everywhere. Democracies are characterized by increasing resort to authoritarian forms of governance within the facade of a democratic structure, or they are increasingly being marked by a form of political polarization, the United States is, is an example, which is making the solution of collective problems more and more difficult. The symptoms of this decline are pretty similar everywhere. Uh, erosion of institutions, and particularly the sidelining and marginalization of legislatures. The suppression of civil liberties. But I think the suppression of civil liberties at this historical juncture is taking a very, very particular form, which I think bears attention. So normally when we think of authoritarian repression, when you think of the last phase of democratic backsliding uh, that happened in the 1970s, and again, I think it's worth noticing that these things seem to come in waves globally. Uh, 1970s, India had emergency, but by the way, authoritarian crackdown was actually a global phenomenon in the 1970s, right? But in the 1970s, much of that authoritarian backsliding actually took the form of mass repression, like as we saw in the emergency in India. Large numbers of people arrested, right? Uh, just to take one example. The contemporary form of authoritarianism and suppression of civil liberties is more subtle, and perhaps for that reason more insidious and more effective, right? One of the ways in which we can disguise contemporary authoritarianism, right, is in a sense by maintaining what people call statistical innocence. So contemporary authoritarians, whether it's Viktor Orban, whether it's perhaps Prime Minister Narendra Modi, perhaps uh, Erdogan, are right in saying that it's not fair to compare this moment to the 1970s. Where are the mass arrests, right? There are lots of journalists in this room. There are professors like us still speaking, right? right? But what these authoritarian leaders have developed is actually more insidious and effective forms of social control. So not mass arrests, but very, very calibrated and targeted coercion, intimidation, and arrests, right? Which perform exactly the same function that mass arrests might have. Not large-scale riots yet, although that might still happen but very well targeted forms of intimidation that send the right messages to the right community. So in some senses, it's, it's a subtle and, as I said, insidious form of coercion, because one of the things it does is it allows us, all of us, to sustain this illusion that authoritarianism is not a real threat, that it is not, in some senses, statistically going to affect us. Right? There is the erosion of citizenship as an ideal. Uh, the information order is being increasingly controlled. It is unclear how successful liberal democracies will be in solving some of the fundamental crises of our age, uh, growing inequality, climate change. And there is a kind of corrosion of civil society that is the heart of contemporary democratic erosion a kind of legitimization of vigilantism of civil society across a wide range of domains and activities. So in almost all of these ways, and I think this is, this is true of most democracies, right? Uh, if you take France, for example, President Macron is actually governing much more through executive power, bypassing the legislature, using ordinances, right? Just to take one example. Uh, than actually was ever the case in recent French democratic history. Uh, right? But I think it is also worth noting, and, and I want to kind of begin by setting the largest possible uh, 
uh, uh, canvas for this, that the crisis for legit of legitimation is not something that is just afflicting liberal democracies. Uh, one of the striking features of the contemporary world is that almost all the foundational normative projects that defined political legitimacy in the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century are actually under crisis, right? Uh, we often think of the 20th century, right, as a kind of contrast, as a contest between two competing ideologies, right? Capital socialism was one dimension, if you wanted to think of it economically. And authoritarianism and democracy was another dimension, if you wanted to think of this contest politically, right? But another way of thinking about the 20th century is to look at some of the foundational normative projects that define the politics of different parts of the world, right? For countries like India, it was the project of how do you institute a liberal representative democracy under conditions that were not thought to be propitious for that project, right? And broadly speaking, broadly speaking, Indian politics worked within the horizon of that project. The claim is not that these projects were successful or that they were deeply institutionalized, but those were the normative frames, right? They were the defining features of the debates within which our debates were conducted, right? But there were three or four other projects. Uh, if you look at China, for instance, right? The party state, as a very distinctive political form, right? And I think it's important to emphasize that the party state in China is a distinctive political form. It can cut across the capitalism-socialism dichotomy, right? At points, it can even cut across the democratic incorporation authoritarianism dichotomy. The party state as a political form in China is also under deep stress. And one indication of the deep stress it is in under, under is the fact that any time a state has to resort to even more authoritarian control, right, you know it is facing a legitimation crisis. There was a second big project that the 20th century bequeathed. Uh, this is a project that defined debates from Pakistan to Nigeria to Egypt to Turkey. Is there the possibility of a kind of modern Islamic constitutionalism that can actually be institutionalized, right? Provide the model for working states that are both Islamic and modern. And I don't think this audience needs telling this project is in deep crisis, to put it mildly, right? It's at a complete normative dead end. Even Iran, right? in some senses where this project had deep political legitimacy because it came out of a kind of revolutionary tradition, right? Uh, I think Iran is on the verge of a major, major legitimation crisis. There was another project in Africa, right? I mean, the hopes for pan-Africanism in the 1950s, uh, the expectations uh, after the end of apartheid in South Africa, that somehow Africa could create forms of democratic governance where race and the color line as axes of subordination and deprivation in the international system will no longer be reproduced, right? That project is in tatters, right? So we are at this astonishing moment, I think, in, you know, as we near the third of the 21st century, where almost all the normative horizons that defined politics in these different parts of the world, right? Seem to be on the surface functioning, right? But they also seem to be at the same time have reached a kind of dead end. It's like the shell of these projects is there, but if you crack open the shell, there is a kind of internal crisis of legitimacy. But these are being held together by the fact that we are not clear what the alternatives to these projects in these different parts of the world is, right? How will the crisis of liberal democracy be resolved? How will the crisis of the party state, in some senses, be resolved, right? So, you know, there's this phrase 
um, in, 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 in Hindi, right? Farz adai ho rahi hai, right? We are going through the motions of these institutional forms, even as we experience them as deeply internally corroded. Now, what I want to do for the rest of the lecture, kind of just to set the stage, that I think it is important to remember that this is a global crisis. And there are some features common that cut across political forms. It doesn't matter whether you are a party state in China or whether in some senses you are a liberal democracy like India, right? Now, what I want to do for the rest of this talk is to focus a little bit upon liberal democracies and to pick up on something that Shaibal used to often discuss. Uh, at least in private conversation, but it is something that I think is reflected in some of his writings uh, on democracy as well. So when we think about liberal representative democracy, right, at one level we think of its formal institutions. right. The liberal part is the protection of basic rights that citizens have, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom against discrimination, freedom from discrimination, you know, in a sense, part one of the Indian Constitution, right? But one thing that Shebel always used to remind us of is that democracy fundamentally is a practice of social mediation, right? It's a practice of social mediation in the sense that at the core of democracy is the imagination of a certain kind of relationship that citizens will have with each other, right? And the only foundation for democracy, ultimately, is the commitment and willingness of those citizens to enact those kinds of social relationships, right? There is no foundation to the fact that we are free and equal. The only foundation to the fact is we have to just treat each other as if we were free and equal, right? The minute you begin to ask a foundational question, what is the basis of equality, right? You can be pretty sure that person doesn't mean to treat you equally. He's looking for an excuse to get out of that obligation to create a particular kind of social relationship with you, right? Now, as we know, countries like India were very far from instituting democracy as a social practice, right? But what India had managed to do, like many democracies, is institute democracy at least in two forms of social mediation. One is formal institutional, right? As a democracy, we were committed to saying Yes, there are lots of inequalities in society. Yes, there are deep differences in society. There are intractable social conflicts. But the form in which we will mediate these social conflicts is through formal political institutions, through representative government. Right? The enchantment of Indian democracy was that this form of social mediation, through elections, through parliaments, through preserving something at least of a facade of liberal constitutionalism, right, actually succeeded in conditions that were not thought to be propitious for it. But we are at a historical juncture where I think it's fair to say that except for elections, right, which still remain a fundamental source of legitimation in Indian society, Almost all aspects of that institutional social mediation have more, have more or less collapsed. And again, India is not exceptional in this. Think of the institution of legislatures, parliament, state legislative assemblies. Legislative institutions were in some senses meant to be right, the keystone institution through which social mediation occurs, society figures out, right, what preferences governments will act on, right? It's the form of social mediation through which political power is ultimately legitimized. But one of the things we are noticing the world over is a complete 
collapse of legislative power, accountability, and authority, right? Now, legislatures are peculiar institutions. Legislations are peculiar institutions in one very specific respect, and I just want to lay out the structure of the problem here, which is that a legislator has two sets of relationships to negotiate. There is the relationship between the legislator and the constituency that selected them, right? The legislator and you know, the MP from Patna, the MLA from Sivan, right? And the second set of relationships that a legislator has to negotiate is the relationship between the legislator and their party and the legislator and other legislators. Now, typically, legislation, legislation, legislators function optimally when these two set of relationships are in perfect balance. If you let individual legislators and their relationship to their constituency exercise veto power over their choices, you can actually get the log jams and anarchy of the US legislator, right? Where in the legislation, the parties are relatively weak, the individual legislator is very strong, right? So remember President Biden's budget negotiations, right? One senator could actually hold, in a sense, the entire budget process to a ransom, right? So that's one kind of problem where the individual legislator is too strong and can exercise a veto problem. On the other hand, there is the Indian legislatures, right? State legislatures, but increasingly parliament, where because of the progressive strengthening and centralization of parties, the individual legislator has absolutely virtually no voice in parliament. In fact, you actually pity MPs and MLAs they are the most disempowered politicians, at least in relation to the business of legislation, right? Except, I think, for the House of Commons, which remarkably, despite everything, despite the institutional corrosion of, you know, Brexit populism, retains something of the romance of legislation, you know, which um, Elias Canetti had once described as, think of this marvel of 600 ambitious, in those days it used to be largely men, watching one another with hawk's eyes, right? And holding each other accountable. There are very few legislators that are now in, have the capacity and capability of performing that accountability function. In India, frankly, the legislature has simply become an extended arm of the executive. We are in de facto presidential government, right? Whether we in some senses like it or not. And this is something that had happened at the state level many, many years ago, right? I mean, even the most seasoned politicians and engaged citizens barely take interest in the proceedings of a Vidhan Sabha or a legislative assembly, right? So legislatures are, in some senses, the one institution that mediated social preferences, right? Pretty much under in eclipse. The second institution that, in a democracy, does the job of social mediation is what I would broadly call the information order. Fundamentally, democracies, so we say, the ultimate source of legitimacy is, in some senses, the people, right? And the people exercise their sovereign power through the mobilization and construction of public opinion. One of the remarkable features of democracies across the world is that this information order of democracies, that is the kind of linchpin of democracy, has become irrevocably eroded. And it has been irrevocably eroded through a variety of instruments. There's the simple fact that this vital infrastructure of democracy, as some political theorists call it, the media, right, 
is actually under private and commercial control, right? Where the logic of commerce, in fact, in India, it's not even the logic of commerce, as I'll explain in a second, right? Actually governs uh, what information is shared, what information is disseminated, right? But at the contemporary, in the contemporary moment, right, almost every aspect of the information order, whether it's social media, right, whether it's television media, large sections of the print media in most democracies of the world are not those free and open spaces that agora that is central to, in some senses, democratic will formation, right? On top of that, right, I mean, once the ownership structures of media gets distorted, it has profound implications for democracy. And it is actually not an accident that almost in every democracy, right, you've either had media moguls rising to power, think of Silvio Berlusconi, right, the media mogul himself decides to, in a sense, become the politician. Or for a brief moment in India, characters like Arnab Goswami, right, without any trace of irony intoning that they represented the people, right? I mean, the, the question is not kind of the individual character or the individual anchor. The question is, what is it about the structure of media that actually allows these kinds of representative claims to happen? Or think of Tucker Carlson in the United States, right? In some senses, right? as becoming single-handedly more representative of the demos than perhaps any politician does. But the distorted ownership structures of media and their colonization by considerations of commerce and power also came at a moment right, uh, where we are in the midst of a different kind of information revolution, uh, namely social media. Now, there are two things we know about social media. At one level, the social media revolution is a bit like the printing revolution in the 17th century. And remember what happened when the printing revolution took place. The printing revolution, at one level, radically democratized knowledge. And I don't think we should underestimate the degree to which social media, in its positive incarnation, did democratize knowledge. It empowered ordinary citizens in ways in which we had actually not imagined. And that empowering, by its very nature and character, corroded hierarchies of knowledge. It undermined gatekeepers. It broke open all kinds of oligarchies that had controlled information order before. There were are three or four other projects. Uh, if you look at China, for instance, right? The party state as a very distinctive political form, right? And I think it's important to emphasize that the party state in China is a distinctive political form. It can cut across the capitalism-socialism dichotomy, right? At points, it can even cut across the democratic incorporation authoritarianism dichotomy. The party state as a political form in China is also under deep stress. And one indication of the deep stress it is in under, under is the fact that any time a state has to resort to even more authoritarian control, right, you know it is facing a legitimation crisis. There was a second big project that the 20th century bequeathed. Uh, this is a project that defined debates from Pakistan to Nigeria to Egypt to Turkey. Is there the possibility of a kind of modern Islamic constitutionalism that can actually be institutionalized, right? Provide the model for working states that are both Islamic and modern. And I don't think this audience needs telling this project is in deep crisis, to put it mildly, right? It's at a complete normative dead end. Even Iran, right? in some senses where this project had deep political legitimacy because it came out of a kind of revolutionary tradition, right? Uh, I think Iran is on the verge of a major, major legitimation crisis.
There was another project in Africa, right? I mean, the hopes for Pan-Africanism in the 1950s, uh, the expectations uh, after the end of apartheid in South Africa, that somehow Africa could create forms of democratic governance where race and the color line as axes of subordination and deprivation in the international system will no longer be reproduced, right? That project is in tatters, right? So we are at this astonishing moment, I think, in, you know, as we near the third of the 21st century, where almost all the normative horizons that defined politics in these different parts of the world, right? seem to be on the surface functioning, right? But they also seem to be at the same time have reached a kind of dead end. It's like the shell of these projects is there, but if you crack open the shell, there is a kind of internal crisis of legitimacy. But these are being held together by the fact that we are not clear what the alternatives to these projects in these different parts of the world is, right? How will the crisis of liberal democracy be resolved? How will the crisis of the party state, in some senses, be resolved, right? So, you know, there's this phrase um, in, 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 in Hindi, right? Farz adai ho rahi hai, right? We are going through the motions of these institutional forms, even as we experience them as deeply internally corroded. Now, what I want to do for the rest of the lecture, kind of just to set the stage, that I think it is important to remember that this is a global crisis. And there are some features common that cut across political forms. It doesn't matter whether you are a party state in China or whether in some senses you are a liberal democracy like India, right? Now, what I want to do for the rest of this talk is to focus a little bit upon liberal democracies and to pick up on something that Scheibel used to often discuss, uh, at least in private conversation, but it is something that I think is reflected in some of his writings uh, on democracy as well. So when we think about liberal representative democracy, right, at one level we think of its formal institutions, right? The liberal part is the protection of basic rights that citizens have, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom against discrimination, freedom from discrimination, you know, in a sense, part one of the Indian constitution, right? But one thing that Shebel always used to remind us of is that democracy fundamentally is a practice of social mediation, right? It's a practice of social mediation in the sense that at the core of democracy is the imagination of a certain kind of relationship that citizens will have with each other, right? And the only foundation for democracy, ultimately, is the commitment and willingness of those citizens to enact those kinds of social relationships, right? There is no foundation to the fact that we are free and equal. The only foundation to the fact is we have to just treat each other as if we were free and equal, right? The minute you begin to ask a foundational question, what is the basis of equality, right? You can be pretty sure that person doesn't mean to treat you equally. He's looking for an excuse to get out of that obligation to create a particular kind of social relationship with you, right? Now, as we know, countries like India were very far from instituting democracy as a social practice, right? But what India had managed to do, like many democracies, is institute democracy at least in two forms of social mediation. One is formal institutional. As a democracy, we were committed to saying, yes, there are lots of inequalities in society. Yes, there are deep differences in society. There are intractable social conflicts. But the form in which we will mediate these social conflicts is through formal political institutions, through representative government. 
the enchantment of Indian democracy was that this form of social mediation through elections, through parliaments, through preserving something at least of a facade of liberal constitutionalism, right, actually succeeded in conditions that were not thought to be propitious for it. But we are at a historical juncture where I think it's fair to say that except for elections, right, which still remain a fundamental source of legitimation in Indian society, almost all aspects of that institutional social mediation have more, have more or less collapsed. And again, India is not exceptional in this. Think of the institution of legislatures, parliament, state legislative assemblies. Legislative institutions were in some senses meant to be the keystone institution through which social mediation occurs. Society figures out right, what preferences governments will act on. Right? It's the form of social mediation through which political power is ultimately legitimized. But one of the things we are noticing the world over is a complete collapse of legislative power, accountability, and authority. Right? Now, legislatures are peculiar institutions. Legislations are peculiar institutions in one very specific respect, and I just want to lay out the structure of the problem here, which is that a legislator has two sets of relationships to negotiate. There is the relationship between the legislator and the constituency that selected them, right? the legislator and you know, the MP from Patna, the MLA from Sivan, right? And the second set of relationships that a legislator has to negotiate is the relationship between the legislator and their party and the legislator and other legislators, right? Now, typically, legislature, legislation, legislators function optimally when these two set of relationships are in perfect balance. If you let individual legislators and their relationship to their constituency exercise veto power over their choices, you can actually get the log jams and anarchy of the US legislator, right? Where in the legislation, the parties are relatively weak, the individual legislator is very strong, right? So remember President Biden's budget negotiations, right? One senator could actually hold, in a sense, the entire budget process to a ransom, right? So that's one kind of problem where the individual legislator is too strong and can exercise a veto problem. On the other hand, there is the Indian legislatures, right? State legislatures, but increasingly parliament where because of the progressive strengthening and centralization of parties, the individual legislature has absolutely virtually no voice in parliament. In fact, you actually pity MPs and MLAs. They are the most disempowered politicians, at least in relation to the business of legislation. Right? Except, I think, for the House of Commons, which remarkably, despite everything, despite the institutional corrosion of you know, Brexit populism, retains something of the romance of legislation, you know, which um, Elias Canetti had once described as, think of this marvel of 600 ambitious, in those days it used to be largely men, watching one another with hawk's eyes, right? And holding each other accountable. There are very few legislators that are now in, have the capacity and capability of performing that accountability function. In India, frankly, the legislature has simply become an extended arm of the executive. We are in de facto presidential government, right? whether we in some senses like it or not. And this is something that had happened at the state level many, many years ago. Right? I mean, even the most seasoned politicians and engaged citizens 
barely take interest in the proceedings of a Vidhan Sabha or a Legislative Assembly. So legislatures are, in some senses, the one institution that mediated social preferences, right? Pretty much under in eclipse. The second institution that, in a democracy, does the job of social mediation is what I would broadly call the information order. Fundamentally, democracies, so we say, the ultimate source of legitimacy is, in some senses, the people, right? And the people exercise their sovereign power through the mobilization and construction of public opinion. One of the remarkable features of democracies across the world is that this information order of democracies, that is the kind of linchpin of democracy, has become irrevocably eroded. And it has been irrevocably eroded through a variety of instruments. There's the simple fact that this vital infrastructure of democracy, as some political theorists call it, the media, right, is actually under private and commercial control, right? where the logic of commerce, in fact, in India, it's not even the logic of commerce, as I'll explain in, in a second, right, actually governs uh, what information is shared, what information is disseminated. Right? But at the contempor in the contemporary moment, right, almost every aspect of the information order, whether it's social media, whether it's television media, large sections of the print media in most democracies of the world are not those free and open spaces that agora that is central to, in some senses, democratic will formation, right? On top of that, right, I mean, once the ownership structures of media gets distorted, it has profound implications for democracy. And it is actually not an accident that almost in every democracy, right, you've either had media moguls rising to power, think of Silvio Ber Berlusconi, right? The media mogul himself decides to, in a sense, become the politician. Or for a brief moment in India, characters like Arnab Goswami, right, without any trace of irony intoning that they represented the people, right? I mean, the, the question is not kind of, the individual character or the individual anchor. The question is, what is it about the structure of media that actually allows these kinds of representative claims to happen? Or think of Tucker Carlson in the United States, right? In some senses, right? As becoming single-handedly more representative of the demos than perhaps any politician does. But the distorted ownership structures of media and their colonization by considerations of commerce and power also came at a moment right, uh, where we are in the midst of a different kind of information revolution, uh, namely social media. Now, there are two things we know about social media. At one level, the social media revolution is a bit like the printing revolution in the 17th century. And remember what happened when the printing revolution took place. The printing revolution, at one level, radically democratized knowledge. And I don't think we should underestimate the degree to which social media, in its positive incarnation, did democratize knowledge. It empowered ordinary citizens in ways in which we had actually not imagined. And that empowering, by its very nature and character, corroded hierarchies of knowledge, it undermined gatekeepers, it broke open all kinds of oligarchies that had controlled information order before. Positive side. But there was a kind of negative dialectic in some senses to this information order. The negative dialectic was that we, sub we, we became more subject to information flows that are determined by commercial considerations and algorithms, right? The negative dialectic was 
that in some senses we could create information bubbles and communities of identification, right? Where our core beliefs were insulated from fact-checking, debate, discursive criticism, and so forth. And in a strange kind of way, this information order also led to a kind of collapse of context. Right? <laughs> Think of what it means to communicate of, on social media. Let us say one of you today just posts, let's say, an image of Lord Ganesha, a painting of Lord Ganesha, just, you know, nice painting. You will immediately get about 55 different interpretations of your act, right? Are you a closet Hindutva Vadi? Are you mocking Lord Ganesha? Are you simply an aesthetician, right? Who's treating Ganesha as an aesthetic object, right? Because one of the things we realized that in the act of communication, not only is context important, right? That's a kind of, almost kind of point too obvious to make. But when acts of utterance can be contextualized and recontextualized, both the speaker and hearer feel the sense of a loss of meaning in their utterance, right? So when you look at social media now, for the most part, right, what engages you is not the meaning that individual acts of utterance convey. Because those meanings can be not just interpreted in different ways. Uh, the speaker's context or, or what the speaker said can be so taken out of context and recontextualized in ways that none of us now have the illusion that communication, that an act of communication is leading to understanding, right? What we in a sense fall back on is simply communication as a kind of form of expression, a form of identification with our tribe, our group, protecting our core beliefs. So you have a kind of information order where the core ambition of communication, which is to reach mutual understanding, has in a sense been replaced by, in some senses, the imperative to cut, right? In a sense, the imperative to express identities rather than reach a form of mutual understanding. Now this poses a problem for democracy, right? Which is, if the two central institutional forms of social mediation, which is the representative process through legislatures, and the information order broadly construed, I mean, I'm, I can also talk about a academics in this context and the kind of abdication of academics. If these two forms are both deeply distorted, then how do we come to a determination of what public opinion is? Right? Because remember, one of the interesting things about public opinion is that public opinion is a reflexive concept. In part, public opinion can become what people think public opinion is. Right? Okay. So we are at a moment where, as I said, these institutional forms of mediation that formal liberal democracy requires relies on are immensely weak and incapable of doing much of the work that democracy expects from them. But there is a second challenge as well. Right? And this challenge brings us closer to, I think, something Shebel's work would have drawn attention to at this historical moment. You might say, for, OK, forget. Forget about these formal institutions for a moment. right? We know the crisis of legislatures. We know the crisis of media. But what about the people? What about the political agency of the people and social movements? Now, in democracies historically, the people are made a political category through the modes of collective action that they deploy. It is one thing Shaibal Gupta always used to remind us of, right? that at one level, the people is an abstraction, right? We are all trying to second guess what we think the people are. How do we know the people? 
we know the people through the different forms of collective action and agency by which they express their will, right? So think of the 1970s when there was this great era of democratic backsliding, right? How did the people respond? The people responded through social movements. The people responded through the students' movement. The people responded through the labor movement. The people responded even through the farmers' movement in some ways, right? And so the people are always made political actors, as I said, through the forms of collective action and agency they deploy. Now, one of the interesting challenges for democracy at our moment is what are the forms of collective agency that the people are employing, other than the act of voting, right, which is, which is in a sense the one cornerstone of democracy, through which to express their identity as a political actor in the people, right? One of the striking features of our time is that almost all traditional forms of social movements that used to be the way in which people used to express their collective agency have more or less disappeared from public view. Uh, there is an Italian um, social theorist, Mario Tronti, who has this lovely line where he argues that populism becomes a possibility when the people no longer exist. Now, at one level, this might seem like a very paradoxical line. What do you mean populism becomes a possibility when the people no longer exist, right? Isn't populism supposed to be an expression of the people against elites? But what he had in mind was something very specific, which was that when we used to think of the people, right, janta agai, the people always had, came in definite shapes and forms. Students agai, farmers, labor, right? What do we think of when we now evoke the term janta agai, the people have come? Who are these people? Now, it's no surprise that if you look at almost all the traditional forms in which that collective form of political agency has been expressed, as I said, have disappeared. Student movements. It is truly astonishing. I mean, Chile was, is the only recent exception to this where you actually literally had an election that was steered by student movements. Right? It kind of reminded you of the 1970s, you know, Nitish and Lalu as student leaders, right? In some senses, spearheading a kind of social revolution, right? Student movements have virtually disappeared from the Indian political landscape. We know for a fact, right, that urban unemployment amongst graduates that's the one constituency where unemployment is the highest, and not surprisingly, right? And yet, yet, the depoliticization and the unavailability of students as a social class, as a social group, acting in forms of collective agency, more or less disappeared. Labor movement. Of course, not surprising in a country like India where formal labor is small, right? Uh, more or less, right? Uh, completely decimated since the late 1970s, right? Farmers' movement. At one level, you might say, look, we just had an extraordinary farmers' movement, uh, you know, not that long ago. What are we talking about? But you know what was interesting about that farmers' movement in hindsight, perhaps not in hindsight, I think it was said even at that contemporary moment, that that farmers' movement in Punjab, parts of Punjab, parts of Haryana, parts of Western UP, could sustain itself because it became largely a movement about Punjabi identity. It was very difficult to characterize that movement in traditional class terms, right? So, the traditional ways in which 
the people as social categories used to express themselves as political agents. The model has disappeared from the scene. Right? So you might say, okay, maybe those kinds of movements have disappeared. What about other forms of collective agency that have characterized Indian politics? Caste, for example, right? In the 1980s and 90s, 90s, caste mobilization was a incredible facet of Indian politics. Uh, and caste still remains very central to Indian politics. Despite incredible progress, caste is an ugly reality of Indian society. Discrimination, deprivation, humiliation, segregation in the name of caste is a reality, especially for Dalits. And even as caste has modernized, uh, and even as in some areas you see immense progress, right? there is no question that it still marks the social experience of most Indians in very deep and profound ways, right? And to that extent, caste, as a, caste politics as a form in which the people exercise their collective agency is always going to be a tempting feature of Indian politics. It's not going to go away. But notice what has happened to caste mobilization at this contemporary juncture. There is a long history of caste movements from the early social reform movements in Kerala and in South India to the Mandal movement, right? But in almost all of those movements, right, whether you agreed or disagreed with their demands, there was something of an emancipatory potential, at least in principle. There was a demand for the politics of dignity, there was a demand for greater representation. And in the case of Dalit especially, right, it was a politics that spoke the language of inclusive universalism. The demand in some senses was that hitherto marginalized groups be included right, in this formal regime of liberal representative democracy. Right? Now, caste still remains, as I said, an important axis of political and social mobilization. In fact, the only social protests you can get off the ground very easily that have street power are actually caste-based social protests. But there is increasingly a question whether or not caste politics as is currently being practiced has the same emancipatory and inclusive potential as caste politics of a generation ago. Ideally, when you think of caste politics as having emancipatory potential, right, as being a form in which the people exercise their political agency for more inclusion, that caste politics has to have six features. It must speak the language of universalism. Although caste is a particular identity, the claims that are made on behalf of particular castes are claims name, made in the name of universalism, right? It is the mode through which marginalized groups seek incorporation. It is a language through which individual human rights are claimed, right? The Dalit demand for inclusion isn't a demand for Dalit identity. It can sometimes be that. It is a demand for the more effective realization of equal opportunity and human rights, right? Or the right not to be discriminated. So even though it might arise in a particular historical experience, its demand and language is universal. Second, when caste politics was effective, the logic of caste was agglomerative, right? Think of the SP, for example, in North India or the early anti-caste movements in South India, uh, or even the Mandal moment, whether you agree or disagree with it. The core political claim was that through forms of political action, you can coalesce disparate groups into a larger political entity, right? OBCs, SCs, which makes them more effective 
tools of political mobilization and also gives them greater legitimacy in terms of representation, right? So you're drawing on larger circles of consciousness and solidarity. So it's universal, it's agglomerative. Third, it required a focal point around which you could mobilize. And basically that focal point in Indian politics was reservations, right? That one policy instrument that we convinced ourselves is a measure of inclusion and at least a necessary if not sufficient condition for empowerment. So it requires a focal point. Fourth, the logic of that caste mobilization has some bearing on the logic of economic redistribution. So what is the theory? The theory is if you can institutionalize greater political representation, it will in turn lead to greater economic, social, and other, perhaps even cultural empowerment down the line. So there is a direct connection between forms of representative incorporation, let's say like reservation, and the logic of redistribution. The fifth condition was that other mechanisms that are very important for caste empowerment, right? Economic growth, mobility, because mobility is the only way in which you can produce the disidentification between caste and occupation, right? Education, that those mechanisms are still institutionalized effectively, that reservations and the logic of representation doesn't work in a vacuum, right? And last and finally, as Amit Ahuja's brilliant work on Dalit mobilization has shown, the more effective form of caste mobilization was where that caste mobilization cuts across political parties. The parties themselves are not organized on caste lines, right? Which means there's greater institutionalization of those demands. Now, one of the features of our contemporary moment when we think of caste, which is the principal mode in which the people have, in a sense, mobilized collective agency, is that none of these six conditions I outlined obtain anymore. For the most part, for the most part, the language of caste politics is not speaking the language of universal inclusion. And this has happened for a variety of reasons. The conflation of Mandal politics with the politics of Dalit empowerment, for example, completely makes discrimination an invisible category in Indian ethical and political discourse. Most of contemporary caste mobilization is a form of political mobilization for power sharing, a form of zero-sum game. And you're seeing some of its deadly consequences work out in Manipur as we speak. Second, the Lohiyite idea, right? The Lohiyite idea in politics was that you will have to go through a phase of recognizing caste as a form of political mobilization in order to be able to transcend it, right? People forget the second part of Lohia's argument, right? And yet, we know that if you look at the two dimensions of caste, one is hierarchy and oppression, where we have made modest, very modest achievements, uh, but nothing to be proud about, at least not 75 years after independence. But the second dimension of caste is not hierarchy and oppression. It is the fact that it relies on a system of compulsory identities, right? What is one of the most demeaning aspects of caste is that caste is a form of compulsory identity, right? You are that caste no matter what. That's what made the Indian hierarchical system of hierarchy so insidious. The one thing it did not give anyone is the freedom to define themselves. I mean, why does Ambedkar get so upset at Gandhiji using the term Harijan? I mean, not just the fact that it was condescending, which it was, right? Not just the fact Right? that Ambedkar did not agree with Gandhi's politics. But you know, the ultimate Manuvadi act in India is to actually name somebody's social identity. Because that is what caste is. Right? 
fundamentally the power to trap you in identity forever. It can sometimes be more oppressive, sometimes can be la less oppressive. But at its core, it takes away the freedom from, of self-definition. Right? As I said, we have made some progress on the oppression hierarchy dimension of caste. But in a sense, we have reinstitutionalized caste as a form of compulsory identity. Okay? So the universal claim, universalist claims of caste, that this is a moment towards the transcendence of this identity, have been belied. Caste politics is no longer agglomerative. Bihar pioneered this, right? Remember the logic of BSP mobilization, Dalit mobilization, Mandal mobilization was to congeal caste groups into larger and larger collectivities, right? Now the logic of caste is greater subdivision, right? Both subdivision within the reservation quota, but also subdivision as political identities. Dalits, Mahadalits, right? Upper OBCs, EBCs. You can think of lots of different combinations on this, right? So the logic of subdivision and reclassification, rather than the logic of agglomeration and greater mobilization is what afflicts caste politics. It no longer has a focal point. See, Mandal had a focal point reservations. Now, at one level, you might say reservation still remains a focal point of caste politics, insofar as right, it is a form of mobilization that will resist the rolling back of reservations. Perfectly fine. But around what policy instrument do you actually now mobilize caste politics in larger and larger terms? Right? The fifth instrument, which is the alignment of caste politics with the logic of distribution. Uh, I know there is a demand in this state everywhere else for a caste census, and we can debate the merits and demerits of a caste census. But from a social theory point of view, what's curious about the caste census is that in some ways, the distributive logic of a caste census is actually not clear, at least under contemporary conditions. Why is the distributive logic of a caste census not clear under contemporary conditions? For two reasons. On the one hand, the nature of the welfare state has changed dramatically, particularly with the expansion of state capacity that India has seen in recent years. Most of the things that need to be distributed for the genuine empowerment of people can be distributed without that caste data, right? You can do cash transfers, you can give housing, you should be able to do education, you should be able to do health, right? Practically everything, including employment guarantee schemes, right? So the distributive logic, the bulk of the distributive logic from the state actually can now be institutionalized through more universal schemes. That imperative that it has to be done only through that logic of that identity actually no longer obtains. So that's at the one end of the spectrum, right? Of course we need better data, but most of the things that you need for empowerment actually don't require that data. You're actually kidding yourselves if you think it does, right? On the other hand, paradoxically at the other end of the spectrum, so this is at the level of the state, the private sector, which is actually the main site of the production and reproduction of economic inequality now, is more or less immune from the logic of that caste distribution, right? Now, you have one of two options, right? Either you will be compelled to subject the private economy to the logic of social representation, because if you don't, Right? The connection between distribution and social identity remains severed. TCAP, you know, you can, you, can, you can count all the caste, the state can use it for orders, but all the places where power is actually produced and reproduced, private education, private health, uh, the private economy, those will practically remain immune from 
the logic of that social representation. So caste politics is in this horn of this dilemma, right? What is the focal policy, to, policy instrument around which it mobilizes, right? Does caste politics now have an inclusive and distribution, di distributive logic to it, right? On the other hand, the things that have a distributive logic to them, right? Which is jobs, the private economy, right? we have absolutely the f no faintest idea of what that policy package is that could actually create a more just and inclusive economy, right? So, so this is one example in which you can say that, look, the form of political agency nominally still exists. Yes, caste is important. All political parties will try and do different forms of caste combination. But is it really expressing the people as we think of it, right? In fact, one last hypothesis on caste, which is in a sense caste becomes salient in part, right? One of the things that happened to Indian politics over the last 15, 20 years is that the political agendas, the developmental agendas of almost all political parties are actually not that different from each other, right? Pretty much every state government's formula now is, can we generate enough resources to create two or three schemes that through better administration can stitch together a large enough coalition for us? And the political trick is figuring out which those two are. Is it bicycles for women? Is it you know, free mobility? Is it cash transfers? Is it free health insurance? Is it Narega? Which two or three of those, right? But notice that this way of stitching coalition, right, largely requires technological, technical, technocratic expertise, right? What just ko bolte you know, what we used to say in Bihar, right? Uh, all our Bihari colleagues used to say, prabandhan ki rajniti, right? Sushasan ki rajniti. Sushasan mein social movements kaha hai, right? Where is, in a sense, the agency of the people, in a sense, as we understand it, right? Yeah. So I'd like to submit to you, just in closing, just that we are in this interesting moment, right, where what we used to understand to be the constitutive blocks of social democracy, right, which is the agency of people expressed through forms of collective action. Those are the things that, in some senses, are actually dissipating. Uh, Shaival Gupta wrote once this marvelous, marvelous article, I think, when Nitish Kumar first came to power, about how the task of Indian politics was to rebuild the state, make the state more effective. But here's one of the ironies of this moment. I actually think the Indian state has become more effective. There has been an enormous expansion of state capacity over the last 15, 20 years. And yet, at that very moment of the increase in state capacity, it is actually Indian society, right? It's constituent social groups that have in some senses become weaker. Okay? Now, this is the context, this last sort of point I'm kind of going to make, sorry, I've gone on um, too long, which is, if you now look at the crisis of representation, just to sum up, what we are finding is there are no natural social groups to be represented. Or even if there are, the connection between representation, empowerment, and the distributional logic has been severed. There is a greater atomization of the voter, right? Both in class terms and in caste terms, right? Most political parties converge on economic policy. Now, one of the paradoxes of political parties converging on economic policy, the right can also become a welfare state, you know, uh, 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 or, 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 or take recourse to welfare state ideology. But the more political parties converge on this basic economics governance formula, right? Welfareism under two and a half schemes, the more pressure there is on the rest of politics. Right? How do you actually mobilize in ways that differentiate one party from the other? 
The only way you will do it is in the dimension of culture. Right? But notice what has happened to caste mobilization at this contemporary juncture. There is a long history of caste movements from the early social reform movements in Kerala and South India to the Mandal moment, right? But in almost all of those movements, right, whether you agreed or disagreed with their demands, there was something of an emancipatory potential, at least in principle. There was a demand for the politics of dignity. There was a demand for greater representation. And in the case of Dalit especially, right, it was a politics that spoke the language of inclusive universalism. The demand in some senses was that hitherto marginalized groups be included right, in this formal regime of liberal representative democracy. Right? Now caste still remains, as I said, a important axis of political and social mobilization. In fact, the only social protests you can get off the ground very easily that have street power are actually caste-based social protests. But there is increasingly a question whether or not caste politics as is currently being practiced has the same emancipatory and inclusive potential as caste politics of a generation ago. Ideally, when you think of caste politics as having emancipatory potential, right, as being a form in which the people exercise their political agency for more inclusion, that caste politics has to have six features. It must speak the language of universalism. Although caste is a particular identity, the claims that are made on behalf of particular castes are claims name, made in the name of universalism, right? It is the mode through which marginalized groups seek incorporation. It is a language through which individual human rights are claimed, right? The Dalit demand for inclusion isn't a demand for Dalit identity. It can sometimes be that. It is a demand for the more effective realization of equal opportunity and human rights, right? Or the right not to be discriminated. So even though it might arise in a particular historical experience, its demand and language is universal. Second, when caste politics was effective, the logic of caste was agglomerative, right? Think of the SP, for example, in North India, or the early anti-caste movements in South India, uh, or even the Mandal moment, whether you agree or disagree with it. The core political claim was that through forms of political action, you can coalesce disparate groups into a larger political entity, right? OBCs, SCs, which makes them more effective tools of political mobilization and also gives them greater legitimacy in terms of representation, right? So you're drawing on larger circles of consciousness and solidarity. So it's universal, it's agglomerative. Third, it required a focal point around which you could mobilize. And basically that focal point in Indian politics was reservations, right? That one policy instrument that we convinced ourselves is a measure of inclusion and at least a necessary if not sufficient condition for empowerment. So it requires a focal point. Fourth, the logic of that caste mobilization has some bearing on the logic of economic redistribution. So what is the theory? The theory is, if you can institutionalize greater political representation, it will in turn lead to greater economic, social, and other, culture, perhaps even cultural empowerment down the line. So there is a direct connection between forms of representative incorporation, let's say like reservation, and the logic of redistribution. The fifth condition, 
was that other mechanisms that are very important for caste empowerment, right? Economic growth, mobility, because mobility is the only way in which you can produce the disidentification between caste and occupation, right? Education, that those mechanisms are still institutionalized effectively, that reservations and the logic of representation doesn't work in a vacuum, right? And last and finally, as Amit Ahuja's brilliant work on Dalit mobilization has shown, the more effective form of caste mobilization was where that caste mobilization cuts across political parties. The parties themselves are not organized on caste lines, right? Which means there's greater institutionalization of those demands. Now, one of the features of our contemporary moment when we think of caste, which is the principal mode in which the people have, in a sense, mobilized collective agency, is that none of these six conditions I outlined obtain anymore. For the most part, for the most part, the language of caste politics is not speaking the language of universal inclusion. And this has happened for a variety of reasons. The conflation of Mandal politics with the politics of Dalit empowerment, for example, completely makes discrimination an invisible category in Indian ethical and political discourse. Most of contemporary caste mobilization is a form of political mobilization for power sharing, a form of zero-sum game. And you're seeing some of its deadly consequences work out in Manipur as we speak. Second, the Lohiyite idea, right? The Lohiyite idea in politics was that you will have to go through a phase of recognizing caste as a form of political mobilization in order to be able to transcend it, right? People forget the second part of Lohiyite's argument, right? And yet, we know that if you look at the two dimensions of caste, one is hierarchy and oppression, where we have made modest, very modest achievements, uh, but nothing to be proud about, at least not 75 years after independence. But the second dimension of caste is not hierarchy and oppression. It is the fact that it relies on a system of compulsory identities, right? What is one of the most demeaning aspects of caste is that caste is a form of compulsory identity, right? You are that caste no matter what. That's what made the Indian hierarchical system of hierarchy so insidious. The one thing it did not give anyone is the freedom to define themselves. I mean, why does Ambedkar get so upset at Gandhiji using the term Harijan? I mean, not just the fact that it was condescending, which it was, right? Not just the fact Right? that Ambedkar did not agree with Gandhi's politics. But you know, the ultimate Manuvadi act in India is to actually name somebody's social identity. Because that is what caste is. Right? Fundamentally, the power to trap you in identity forever. It can sometimes be more oppressive, sometimes can be la less oppressive. But at its core, it takes away the freedom from, of self-definition. Right. As I said, we have made some progress on the oppression hierarchy dimension of caste. But in a sense, we have reinstitutionalized caste as a form of compulsory identity. Okay. So the universal claim, universalist claims of caste, that this is a moment towards the transcendence of this identity, have been belied. Caste politics is no longer agglomerative. Bihar pioneered this, right? Remember the logic of BSP mobilization, Dalit mobilization, Mandal mobilization was to congeal caste groups into larger and larger collectivities, right? Now the logic of caste is greater subdivision, right? Both subdivision within the reservation quota, but also subdivision as political identities, Dalits, Mahadalits, right? Upper OBCs, EBCs. You can think of lots of different combinations on this, right? 
So the logic of subdivision and reclassification, rather than the logic of agglomeration and greater mobilization is what afflicts class politics. It no longer has a focal point. See, Mandal had a focal point reservations. Now at one level, you might say reservation still remains a focal point of caste politics, insofar as right, it is a form of mobilization that will resist the rolling back of reservations. Perfectly fine. But around what policy instrument do you actually now mobilize caste politics in larger and larger terms? The fifth instrument, which is the alignment of caste politics with the logic of distribution. Uh, I know there is a demand in this state everywhere else for a caste census, and we can debate the merits and demerits of a caste census. But from a social theory point of view, what's curious about the caste census is that in some ways, the distributive logic of a caste census is actually not clear at least under contemporary conditions. Why is the distributive logic of a caste census not clear under contemporary conditions? For two reasons. On the one hand, the nature of the welfare state has changed dramatically, particularly with the expansion of state capacity that India has seen in recent years. Most of the things that need to be distributed for the genuine empowerment of people can be distributed without that caste data, right? You can do cash transfers, you can give housing, you should be able to do education, you should be able to do health, right? Practically everything, including employment guarantee schemes, right? So the distributive logic, the bulk of the distributive logic from the state actually can now be institutionalized through more universal schemes, right? Okay. That imperative that it has to be done only through that logic of that identity actually no longer obtains. So that's at the one end of the spectrum, right? Of course we need better data, but most of the things that you need for empowerment actually don't require that data. You're actually kidding yourselves if you think it does. On the other hand, paradoxically, at the other end of the spectrum, so this is at the level of the state, the private sector, which is actually the main site of the production and reproduction of economic inequality now, is more or less immune from the logic of that caste distribution, right? Now, you have one of two options, right? Either you will be compelled to subject the private economy to the logic of social representation. Because if you don't, right, the connection between distribution and social identity remains severed. TKAP, you know, you can, you, can, you can count all the caste, the state can use it for all this, but all the places where power is actually produced and reproduced, private education, private health, uh, the private economy, those will practically remain immune from the logic of that social representation. So caste politics is in this horn of this dilemma, right? What is the focal policy, policy instrument around which it mobilizes, right? Does caste politics now have an inclusive and distribution, distributive logic to it, right? On the other hand, the things that have a distributive logic to them, right, which is jobs, the private economy, right? We have absolutely the f no faintest idea of what that policy package is that could actually create a more just and inclusive economy, right? So, so this is one example in which you, you can say that, look, the form of political agency nominally still exists. Yes, caste is important. All political parties will try and do different forms of caste combination. But is it really expressing the people as we think of it? Right? In fact, one last hypothesis on caste, which is in a sense caste becomes salient in part. Right? One of the things that happened to Indian politics over the last 15, 20 years, 
is that the political agendas, the developmental agendas of almost all political parties are actually not that different from each other, right? Pretty much every state government's formula now is, can we generate enough resources to create two or three schemes that through better administration can stitch together a large enough coalition for us? And the political trick is figuring out which those two are. Is it bicycles for women? Is it you know, free mobility? Is it cash transfers? Is it free health insurance? Is it Narega? Which two or three of those, right? But notice that this way of stitching coalition, right, largely requires technological, technical, technocratic expertise, right? What just go bolte, you know, what we used to say in Bihar, right? Uh, all our Bihari colleagues used to say, Prabandan ki rajniti, right? Sushasan ki rajniti. Sushasan the social movements ka hai, right? Where is, in a sense, the agency of the people, in a sense, as we understand it, right? So I'd like to submit to you, just in closing, just that we are in this interesting moment, right, where what we used to understand to be the constitutive blocks of social democracy, right, which is the agency of people expressed through forms of collective action, those are the things that in some senses are actually dissipating. Uh, Shaival Gupta wrote once this marvelous, marvelous article, I think, when Nitish Kumar first came to power about how the task of Indian politics was to rebuild the state, make the state more effective. But here's one of the ironies of this moment. I actually think the Indian state has become more effective. There has been an enormous expansion of state capacity over the last 15, 20 years. And yet, at that very moment of the increase in state capacity, it is actually Indian society, right? It's constituent social groups that have in some senses become weaker. Okay? Now, this is the context, this last sort of point I kind of want to make, sorry, I've gone on um, too long, which is, if you now look at the crisis of representation, just to sum up, what we are finding is there are no natural social groups to be represented. Or even if there are, the connection between representation, empowerment, and the distributional logic has been severed. There is a greater atomization of the voter, right? Both in class terms and in caste terms, right? Most political parties converge on economic policy. Now, one of the paradoxes of political parties converging on economic policy, the right can also become a welfare state, you know, or take recourse to welfare state ideology. But the more political parties converge on this basic economics governance formula, right? Welfareism under two and a half schemes, the more pressure there is on the rest of politics. Right? How do you actually mobilize in ways that differentiate one party from the other? The only way you will do it is in the dimension of culture. Right? Presumptions on this economic model produces a crisis of mobilization. What do political parties differentiate themselves on? So I would argue that it is not so much that identity politics has replaced economic politics, but it is precisely because there is a convergence on an economic model and an economic model, right? That is not delivering except in one or two areas that you actually have a crisis of representation in politics. So you see the irony of UPA1 as well as NDA, right? We often talk of the coalition of extremes in Bihar, but think of the coalition of extremes nationally. Indian capital is very happy, right? with the current economic policies. The top 20, 30% will do well. The bottom 20, 30%, those whom you can use the instruments of the state to bring in a, into the ambit of welfare, right? They have actually made substantial gains over the last 15, 20 years. It's actually the middle, right? 
in a sense, too prosperous to be central to the welfare state, right? And yet not secure so enough really, in their job prospects to I be able to that. participate in the modern economy. That is actually, in some senses, the most anxious and unstable group. So the question that Shebel would have asked us, I think, at this juncture is, we have actually built out the state, the state but we have, fought, we have forgotten in the processes, where are the people? What are the constituent units through which the people are going to mobilize in ways that create a much more inclusive and representative democracy? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mehta. Uh, I would request <coughs> Sri Anud Kamalji huh. to deliver his oh, yeah, presidential take, take address. And huh. after this, uh, we will open the floor for discussions. So I look forward to your active engagement. And sir, uh, there are also quite a few people online. Around 60 people are online. So I already they have some questions. So. Maybe I'll just... It will be very brief, yeah. my intervention. Mr. Pratap Bhanu Mehta Ji, Adarniya Dr. Ushrasi Gupta Ji, Dr. Abdulhai Sahab, Dr. Smita, and Vidwar Jan. Today, in this Sangoshti, I have been able to do my पहली वजह तो ये होगी कि शेवाल और हम एक साथ पढ़ते थे और पटना कॉलेज में एक ही बैच में थे अगल बगल हमारी कक्षाएं थीं और बाद में भी शेवाल गुप्ता से लंबा संबंध रहा और उनके परिवार से भी शेवाल गुप्ता जितने मेधावी छात्र थे धीरे-धीरे उन्होंने अपने को एक बहुत बड़े बौद्धिक और अर्थशास्त्री के रूप में विकसित किया और पटना को और बिहार को भी विश्व के बौद्धिक मानचित्र में स्थान दिलाया उनके नहीं रहने से हमारा बहुत नुकसान हुआ हमारे इस पूरे राज्य का और देश का भी दूसरी वजह यह हो सकती है कि मैं प्रोफेसर मेहता को पढ़ता रहा हूं और मैं उन्हें साहसी निर्भीक बुद्धिजीवी की तरह देखता रहा हूं और उनको सुनने के लिए ही हम सब यहां आए इसलिए मुझको अध्यक्षता नहीं करनी है मैं तो एक श्रोता की तरह यहां मौजूद हूं और तीसरी वजह यह हो सकती है कि हर आदमी हर चीज के बारे में कुछ न कुछ कह सकता है कविता के बारे में कोई भी आदमी कुछ भी कह देता है वैसे ही डेमोक्रेसी लोकतंत्र के बारे में भी कोई भी कुछ भी कह सकता है मैं भी उन्हीं लोगों में से हूं जो कुछ भी कह दे सकता है लेकिन मेरे मन में कई बार मैं कोई विद्यार्थी नहीं हूं इस विषय का लेकिन एक नागरिक की तरह मैं सोचता हूं कभी-कभी कि यह डेमोक्रेसी बहुत दिनों से तो है नहीं दुनिया में जिसे आज हम जानते हैं एक खास समय पर एक खास विंदु पर इतिहास के ये लोकतंत्र आया निश्चित रूप से इसमें पूंजीवाद के विकास का मुख्य हाथ है और उसको बहुत जरूरत थी एक नए तरह के लोकतंत्र की लोकतंत्र तो कहते हैं भारत में भी पहले था रोम में भी था यूनान में भी था लेकिन इस तरह का लोकतंत्र जिसे हम रिप्रेजेंटेटिव डेमोक्रेसी यहां कहा गया है या लिबरल डेमोक्रेसी यह एक नई चीज थी और यह पूंजीवाद के विकास के साथ उसकी जरूरतों के तहत आई और बहुत अच्छा काम इसने किया राजतंत्र को खत्म किया सामंतवाद को खत्म किया जो उत्पादन की पुरानी व्यवस्थाएं थी उनको खत्म किया लेकिन अब इस पूंजीवाद को उस लोकतंत्र की जरूरत नहीं है अब ये एकाधिकार के साथ पूरी दुनिया में शासन कर रहा है जैसा प्रोफेसर मेहता ने अपने इस अद्भुत व्याख्यान में बताया कि पूरी दुनिया में लोकतंत्र संकट में है क्यों है पूरी दुनिया में एक साथ संकट 
क्योंकि पूरी दुनिया में पूंजीवाद ही है अपने अलग अलग रूपों में अलग अलग चरणों में इसलिए ये संकट तो होगा और इस संकट को समझते हुए मैं ठीक से समझ नहीं सकता इसको लेकिन जो शुरू से मुझको लगता है कि लोकतंत्र आखिर है क्या किसको हम लोकतंत्र मानेंगे जैसे भारत में आज़ादी के बाद 75 साल से भी ज़्यादा हुए कब लोकतंत्र था कब लोकतंत्र इस तरह से विकसित हुआ कि आज की हालत हो गई मुझको लगता है जो पहली बात कि किसी भी समाज को जानने का सबसे अचूक नुस्खा ये है कि उस समाज में जो सबसे कमज़ोर आदमी है उसके साथ क्या हो रहा है अब ये कमज़ोर आदमी कई तरह से हो सकता है जो गरीब हो जिसकी संख्या बहुत कम हो नगण्य भी हो सकती है आज भारत के लोकतंत्र की सबसे बड़ी खासियत या खराबी यह है कि यहाँ संख्या बल की राजनीति है आपको इतनी संख्या चाहिए कि आप शासन में आ जाएं। तो सबसे कमजोर आदमी का क्या होगा यह बात मुझे चिंतित करती है मान लीजिए मेरे समुदाय का केवल सौ आदमी इस पूरे देश में हो या मैं अकेला हूं और मैं इतना कमजोर हूं कि कुछ भी नहीं कर सकता मेरा मस्तिष्क मेरा शरीर कुछ भी करने की हालत में नहीं है तो क्या मुझे जीने का हक नहीं होगा क्या ऐसे लोगों को जीने का हक इस देश में और पूरी दुनिया में आज है ये बात मुझको चिंतित करती है दूसरी बात जिसकी तरफ प्रोफेसर मेहता ने भी संकेत किया और बताया जैसे क्या है लोकतंत्र आखिर इस देश में एक प्रतिशत लोगों के हाथ में सत्तर प्रतिशत संपत्ति है और ये सरकार खुद कहती है बेशर्मी के साथ क्या ये लोकतंत्र है किस हिसाब से ये लोकतंत्र है क्या अमेरिका में लोकतंत्र है जहां का राष्ट्रपति सारा कागज पत्थर लेके घर भाग जाता है और बेशर्मी के साथ वो गद्दी छोड़ने को तैयार नहीं होता अब उस पर मुकदमा चल रहा है और वहां के अभी के राष्ट्रपति का लड़का कभी भी गिरफ्तार हो सकते या शायद हो भी गया हो हंटर ये कैसा लोकतंत्र है इंग्लैंड की वही हालत है फ्रांस जर्मनी सबकी वही हालत है तो ऐसा क्यों है इसी के साथ एक अच्छी बात भी है प्रोफेसर मेहता ने उसकी तरफ कहा कि भारत में जो प्रोटेस्ट है उसकी जगह कम होती गई है लेकिन मैं भारत में भी देखता हूं कि विरोध इतने तरह से हो रहा है उनको जोड़ने वाली शक्ति कोई नहीं है जो मणिपुर में हो रहा है वो भी विरोध का ही है आखिर वो वहाँ आरक्षण के लिए जो पूरा मामला है वो क्या है आरक्षण का सीधा संबंध पैसे से है आर्थिक समस्या है ये जो लोग जनमना जाति का विरोध करते हैं वो जनमना संपत्ति का विरोध नहीं करते सभी जातियों के नेता क्यों सबसे बड़े बाहुबली ही होते हैं ये जो स्त्रियाँ ये कुश्ती लड़ने वाली लड़कियां हमारी और इनके विरोध में एक जाति की महासभा उतर आती है क्या ये लोकतंत्र है तो संकट यहां है इस संकट को हम ऐसे समझ सकते हैं कि अब कुछ भी सर्वनिष्ठ नहीं रहा कॉमन इंटरेस्ट्स का स्थान सेक्शनल इंटरेस्ट्स ने ले लिया जब ऐसा हो जब ये पूरा समाज ही विखंडित हो फ्रैगमेंटेड हो तो लोकतंत्र संभव नहीं है लोकतंत्र के लिए जरूरी है कि कुछ न कुछ आधार हो सर्वनिष्ठ आधार वो हमने खो दिया तीसरी बात जो मुझको लगती है या चौथी बात वो है कि लोकतंत्र सब कुछ के बावजूद एक ऐसी व्यवस्था बनी मनुष्यता के इतिहास में जिसने मनुष्य की निजता को सबसे ज्यादा महत्व दिया मनुष्य की निजता का इतना सम्मान मनुष्यता के इतिहास में पहले कभी नहीं हुआ और सभी सिद्धांतकारों ने मनुष्य की निजता व्यक्ति की निजता इस पर जोर दिया 
लेकिन अब भी तो मैं जहाँ जाता हूँ लिखा मिलता है कि आप सी सी टी वी कैमरे की जद में हैं मैं कई बार हवाई अड्डे या स्टेशन के शौचालयों में भी देखता हूँ कि वहाँ भी तो ये नहीं लिखा हुआ है हालत ये है इस देश की और पूरी दुनिया की क्या हालत है अभी इतना हुआ कि सारे आंकड़े किसी ने चुरा लिए आधार के इससे क्या हुआ मुझको समझ में नहीं है अगर ले ही लिया तो क्या होगा लेकिन ये हमारी निजता का हनन है हमारे पास अब कोई निजता नहीं है अगर मैं यहां से अचानक घर छोड़ के भागना चाहूं मैं भाग नहीं सकता हर जगह हमको अपना आधार कार्ड दिखाना होगा मैं एक आंकड़े में बदल दिया गया हूं आप सब आप समझते रहें कि आप बहुत ताकतवर हैं कुछ नहीं है और कोई भी सत्ता की शक्ति आकर आपको कभी भी जेल में डाल सकती है आपकी निजता का अंत यहां जाकर होता है तो लोकतंत्र का सवाल ही नहीं पैदा होता पूरी दुनिया में यह खतरा है लेकिन जैसा प्रोफेसर मेहता ने बताया कि प्रोटेस्ट का स्पेस जो भारत में कम हो रहा है वो कम नहीं हो रहा है वास्तव में अभी इतना प्रोटेस्ट इंग्लैंड में हुआ वहां सब कुछ ठप रहा वहां की ट्यूब बंद रही वहां के कारखाने बंद रहे और भयानक हालत हो गई बिजली मजदूरों ने भी हड़ताल की फ्रांस में भी अभी भी यही हुआ इटली में हुआ जर्मनी में हुआ फ्रांस में हुआ और भारत में लगातार सब जगह हो रहा है मैंने देखा बहुत ध्यान से कि पिछले दस वर्षों में जितनी गिरफ्तारियां लाठी चार्ज बिहार में हुआ उतना शायद ही कभी हुआ हो ऐसा कैसे सिर्फ अखबार को रोज देखने की जरूरत है इसका मतलब कि लोग विरोध कर रहे हैं और सबसे गरीब लोग आशा कार्यकर्ता आंगनवाड़ी कार्यकर्ता और आप उन पर लाठियां चलाते हैं इसी के साथ एक जुड़ी हुई बात और है कि जो हमारा मध्यम वर्ग है वो बिल्कुल आत्म केंद्रित हो चुका है अभी चलने घर से निकलने के पहले मैंने देखा कि एलन मस्क भारत आने वाला है और बहुत स्वागत उसका होगा जिस आदमी ने अपनी कंपनी में काम करने वाले हजारों लाखों लोगों को निकाल दिया अब पूरी दुनिया में चू तक नहीं हुई उसका हम किस मुंह से स्वागत करेंगे कोई बोलने वाला है ये लड़कियां जो इतने दिन से पुलिस द्वारा घसीटी जाती रही और ये मैं सोचता हूं कि ताकत क्या होती है लोकतंत्र क्यों चाहिए हमको हमको ज्यादा ताकतवर बनाने के लिए मैं सोचता हूं कि शारीरिक ताकत का क्या मतलब इनसे ज्यादा ताकतवर कौन होगा इन लड़कियों से ज्यादा ताकतवर लेकिन सत्ता के सामने वो कुछ नहीं है और पूरा देश पूरा मध्यम वर्ग खामोश है तो प्रोफेसर मेहता ने बिल्कुल इस मामले में भारत के बारे में सही कहा कि यहां प्रोटेस्ट का वो स्पेस सिकुड़ता जा रहा है लेकिन दूसरे लोग तो कर रहे हैं विरोध अपने देश में भी आदिवासी भी कर रहे हैं दलित भी कर रहे हैं बेरोजगार लोग भी कर रहे हैं लेकिन उनको जोड़ने वाली शक्ति नहीं है तो मुझको लोकतंत्र के बारे में सोचते हुए एक साधारण आदमी की तरह यही सब लगता है मैं वोट देने भी जाता हूं हमेशा ये सोच के कि मेरा वोट पड़ चुका होगा लेकिन कुछ ऐसा हुआ टी एन के बाद से कि मैं ज़्यादा निश्चिंत अनुभव करने लगा और मैं वोट दे पाता हूं लेकिन नोटा भी आया है और कई जगहों पर नोटा में ज़्यादा वोट पड़े हैं चाहे वो बंगाल हो या कोई भी उत्तर प्रदेश हो जो हालत है चुनावों की चुनावों के समय घर से निकलना जान जोखिम में डालना है ये कैसा लोकतंत्र है जहाँ चुनावों के दिन भी हम घर में बंद रहने को अभिशप्त होते हैं ये कुछ बातें मेरे दिमाग में आती हैं और मैं यही हमेशा सोचता हूँ कि आखिर ये कब ख़त्म होगा और हम कहाँ पहुँचेंगे तो जो पॉन्टी के उदाहरण दिए प्रोफेसर मेहता ने 
कि पॉपुलिज्म में एक संभावना तब होती है जब वेन पीपल सीज टू एग्जिस्ट आर वी गोइंग टू सीज टू एग्जिस्ट एज पीपल आर वी नॉट गोइंग टू सेव अवर सेल्स एज पीपल डोंट वी हैव एनी सेंस ऑफ बींग पीपल एज ए कलेक्टिव वो कलेक्टिव सेंस जब होगा तभी डेमोक्रेसी होगी मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूँ आप सबको और धन्यवाद प्रोफेसर मेहता को कि उन्होंने अपने इस अद्भुत भाषण से मैं आज भी उनको पढ़ के यहाँ आया मैं इंडियन एक्सप्रेस लेता हूँ और सबसे पहले मैं देखता हूँ कि प्रोफेसर मेहता का आज लेख है या नहीं आज था मैं पढ़ के आया और आज इतना अच्छा भाषण हम सब लोगों ने सुना मैं प्रोफेसर मेहता को बहुत बहुत बधाई और धन्यवाद देता हूँ और आप सबको बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद धन्यवाद I open the floor for questions. There are already few questions and comments online, but we'll take them later. First, uh, we would like to. Yeah. Um, so, sure. Please introduce yourself and try to be a bit brief. Thank you, sir, for brilliant and profound lecture. Myself, sir, Dr. Vidyarthi Vikas, Assistant Professor of Economics, in Sinha Institute of Social Studies, Patna. Sir, you have already referred BDM reports, which says that, sir, India is moving towards elected dictatorship. BDM report says, and whatever, what is came in mind, my mind that did Indian contemporary intellectuals or working class or socialist and leftist also underestimate the rise of Modi as a fascist. Clara Jetkin, 1923, commented the same ideas for Hitler regime. And second question is, does government of India follow the doctrine of fascism inspired by the Manu Smriti, Hitler's idea or bunch of thought? Coincidence or conspiracy, Modi government is creating the situation like Hitler regime in India. Hitler also created the same situation in their country for the Jew, leftist, socialist, and Democrats also. And third question is, the question arises whether the land of democracy, that is India, is ready for fascism or genocide. Genocide report watch 21 rep reported that India has crossed eight out of ten characteristics stages of genocide. It seems okay. that. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank I you. Think, uh, that is enough. Uh, let us take a few more and then, uh, Professor. So, Manish ji wants to ask. Uh, I'll come to you, sir. लेकिन सत्ता के सामने वो कुछ नहीं है पूरा देश पूरा मध्यम वर्ग खामोश है तो प्रोफेसर मेहता ने बिल्कुल इस मामले में भारत के बारे में सही कहा कि यहां प्रोटेस्ट का वो स्पेस सिकुड़ता जा रहा है लेकिन दूसरे लोग तो कर रहे हैं विरोध अपने देश में भी आदिवासी भी कर रहे हैं दलित भी कर रहे हैं बेरोजगार लोग भी कर रहे हैं लेकिन उनको जोड़ने वाली शक्ति नहीं है तो मुझको लोकतंत्र के बारे में सोचते हुए एक साधारण आदमी की तरह यही सब लगता है मैं वोट देने भी जाता हूँ हमेशा ये सोच के कि मेरा वोट पड़ चुका होगा लेकिन कुछ ऐसा हुआ टी एन के बाद से कि मैं ज़्यादा निश्चिंत अनुभव करने लगा और मैं वोट दे पाता हूँ लेकिन नोटा भी आया है 
और कई जगहों पर नोटा में ज़्यादा वोट पड़े हैं चाहे वो बंगाल हो या कोई भी उत्तर प्रदेश हो जो हालत है चुनावों की चुनावों के समय घर से निकलना जान जोखिम में डालना है ये कैसा लोकतंत्र है जहाँ चुनावों के दिन भी हम घर में बंद रहने को अभिशप्त होते हैं ये कुछ बातें मेरे दिमाग में आती हैं और मैं यही हमेशा सोचता हूँ कि आखिर ये कब ख़त्म होगा और हम कहाँ पहुँचेंगे तो जो पॉन्टी के उदाहरण दिए प्रोफेसर मेहता ने कि पॉपुलिज्म में एक संभावना तब होती है जब वन पीपल सीज टू एग्जिस्ट आर वी गोइंग टू सीज टू एग्जिस्ट एज पीपल आर वी नॉट गोइंग टू सेव अवर सेल्स एज पीपल डोंट वी हैव एनी सेंस ऑफ बींग पीपल एज ए कलेक्टिव वो कलेक्टिव सेंस जब होगा तभी डेमोक्रेसी होगी मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूँ आप सबको और धन्यवाद प्रोफेसर मेहता को कि उन्होंने अपने इस अद्भुत भाषण से मैं आज भी उनको पढ़ के यहाँ आया मैं इंडियन एक्सप्रेस लेता हूँ और सबसे पहले मैं देखता हूँ कि प्रोफेसर मेहता का आज लेख है या नहीं आज था मैं पढ़ के आया और आज इतना अच्छा भाषण हम सब लोगों ने सुना मैं प्रोफेसर मेहता को बहुत बहुत बधाई और धन्यवाद देता हूँ और आप सबको बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद धन्यवाद I open the floor for questions. There are already few questions and comments online, but we'll take them later. First, uh, we would like to. Yeah. Um, so, sure. Please introduce yourself and try to be a bit brief. Thank you, sir, for brilliant and profound lecture. Myself, sir, Dr. Vidyarthi Vikas, Assistant Professor of Economics, Ain Sinha Institute of Social Studies, Patna. Sir, you have already referred B Dam reports, which says that, sir, India is moving towards elected dictatorship. B Dam report says, and whatever, what is came in mind, my mind that did Indian contemporary intellectuals or working class or socialist and leftist also underestimate the rise of modi as a fascist clara jetkin 1923 commented the same ideas for hitler regime and second question is dutch government of india follow the doctrine of fascism inspired by the manu smriti hitler's idea or bunch of thought coincidence or conspiracy modi government is creating the situation like hitler regime in india hitler also created the same situation in their country for the jew leftist socialist and democrats also and third question is the question arises whether the land of democracy that is india is ready for fascism or genocide genocide report watch 21 rep reported that india has crossed eight out of 10 character sticks stages of genocide it seems okay. that uh, thank you sir thank I you think, uh, that is enough uh, let us take a few more and then uh, professor so manish ji wants to ask uh, i'll come to you sir in, in india as soon as you say situation in india is like that immediately after you say that it is global global phenomena what is the intensity difference between the two because this is averaging it is in india it is everywhere 
So what, what, uh, hello? Yes. Okay, sorry. So do you justify the present situation in India because of this, because it is global, that is why it is justified in India also. One second, let's second thing, money. similar right. question is 1970 and today you said. The situation is similar. So many people were arrested at that time. Now they are not being arrested, but the situation is similar here also. It will happen again after some time. So again, the intensity between the two. What is the difference? What is the ratio? And third point is you talked about caste, caste politics, but you did not talk about minor, uh, minority and majority politics. Please. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening, Professor Mehta. This is Manish from, I'm a college teacher. Uh, we had the pleasure of listening to you in 2013 and then again in 2015. I'm so thankful to you that we are here in Patna at Adri. In fact, we had also tried very hard to bring you in. Okay. Please be, uh, please okay. be to the so, point. So thank you so much. You have lived up to your expectation. But you make a distinction, but you do not make a distinction between the crisis of democracy in advanced economies and democracy in developing de uh, economies like India. You know, there is a big difference between them. For instance, the crisis in American democracy or in European democracy is one b which has largely come about because of globalization. You know, the middle class has hollowed out. But India has largely been a beneficiary of globalization and many of the market economic uh, policies which have been falling for the past three decades. In fact, you have mentioned in your uh, lecture that the state capacity has gone up. Secondly, you talk about the crisis of representative democracy, but if you look at the figures for the past 30 years, you know the representation, representation of OBCs, SCs, STs, and they have gone phenomenally up, in, in fact, in both the state legislature and even in the Lok Sabha. So the representative democracy, you know, the legislative part, that has become more inclusive. So I, I guess, you know, I, what I infer from your lecture is that you are largely talking about the crisis, the, the first part of liberal democracy, that there is a crisis of liberalism in India or globally, but not of democracy as such. Uh, don't you think it is also a crisis of politics, in fact, and not of democracy? Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, so sir I have a question. Is India still a democracy? And why our institutions are, whenever somebody with a streak of you know, autocratic tendency why our institutions are so willing to be co-opted by that person or the ruler who is at the helm of affairs? Why our institutions are so weak? Yeah, the lady in green and then uh, this gentleman here in front. Uh, thank you, sir, for your insightful lecture. Sir, you talked about collective agents, uh, agencies characterizing Indian politics. You talked about um, language and caste, how it characterizes politics. So don't you think religion also plays an important role in this? Thank you. Sir, uh, Chandan from BBC. आपने दलित पॉलिटिक्स की बात की उसमें एक सवाल मेरे मन में आया कि बिहार ही नहीं पूरे देश में दलित पॉलिटिक्स जो है वो काफी पीछे रहता है दलित नेता कोई उभर करके एक नेतृत्व के तौर पर क्यों नहीं सामने निकला जैसे थोड़े समय के लिए हमने मायावती को उत्तर प्रदेश में देखा बिहार में ये लैकिंग क्यों रहा है अब तक आपको क्या नजर आता है सर नमस्कार मेरा नाम शशि भूषण हुआ मैं पत्रकार हूं सर मेरा सवाल है आपने अपने लेक्चर में बोला कि जो स्टूडेंट स्टूडेंट मूवमेंट है वो कम हो गया है या खत्म हो गया है देश में तो सर इसका क्या कारण है क्योंकि अभी जो हमारे प्रदेश के अपने बिहार के बात करें तो नीतीश जी और लालू प्रसाद अभी शिवानंद तिवारी जी भी बैठे थे ये दे आर ऑल फ्रॉम स्टूडेंट मूवमेंट के ही ये लोग प्रोडक्ट हैं हाँ तो क्या ये इन जैसे लोगों ने मतलब कि अपना जो लिगेसी जो रहा उसको आगे नहीं बढ़ाया या फिर क्या कारण आपको देखते हैं देखते हैं प्रदेश में बिहार के संदर्भ में और पूरे देश के संदर्भ में क्यों स्टूडेंट मूवमेंट क्यों नहीं हो पा रहा है एक सक्सेसफुल स्टूडेंट मूवमेंट मेरा नाम डॉक्टर मधुमिता मुखर्जी हुआ आई एम रिटायर्ड एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर फ्रॉम पटना मेडिकल कॉलेज मेरा प्रश्न इतना गंभीर नहीं है मेरा प्रश्न ये है और खास करके ये प्रोफेसर अरुण कमल जी से है कि हम कहते हैं कि पीपल कुछ नहीं है 
तो ये जो मीडिया में सारा समय इतने एब्यूजिव रिमार्क्स आते हैं ये मीडिया एंड ट्विटर एंड क्या क्या व्हाट्सएप में उसमें कभी कभी तो इतने ख़राब से आते हैं जिनको मान लीजिए हम नहीं रिस्पेक्ट करते हैं लेकिन कोई और करते हैं तो वो जो आती है मैं एक एग्जाम्पल दूंगी कि किसी ने कहा कि कमाल हसन ने कहा कि आ, ये इतना बड़ा मंदिर बनाने का क्या ज़रूरत था जबकि आधे लोग तो खाना नहीं मिलता उसके जवाब में उन्होंने बोला कि आ, आप ऐसे मत बोलिए क्योंकि आपको तीन शादियां करने की क्या जरूरत थी जब आधे लोग शादी नहीं करते शादी नहीं होता है तो इसका कि कोई चेक नहीं है आप कहते पीपल का इम्पोर्टेंट नहीं है तो ये कहाँ से आता है ऐसा तो नहीं होना चाहिए थैंक यू मैम ऑल्सो देर आर टू कॉमेंट्स ऑनलाइन वन इज बाई प्रोफेसर सोनाल दे देसाई एंड अनदर इज अ क्वेश्चन बाय प्रोफेसर गोविंद राव कैन यू हेयर मी प्रोफेसर राव वुड यू लाइक टू आस्क योर क्वेश्चन गुड इवनिंग प्रोफेसर मेहता एंड थैंक्स माय क्वेश्चन इज यू नो अ लिटिल मोर कॉन्सेप्चुअल you are talking about the tensions and contradictions in liberal democracy like india is it a reflex, reflection of having democracy in a feudal setup uh, and uh, to add to that isn't it are we not trying to force a liberal democracy in a system where both you know roving and stationary bandits exist you know manser wilson's you know sort of characterization of um, dictatorship democracy and development where you know you have the the roving bandits you know becoming stationary bandits and then you know moving further so you have a demo, you are trying to place a democracy where you have both stationary uh, yeah, roving and stationary bandits that's all uh, yeah i have two questions so what is the role of uh, dominant obc caste in indian politics and the another one is the how you see the hindutva identity politics in the future aur dr saiba ne jo kaha मैंने ये नहीं कहा कि पीपल कुछ नहीं है मैंने कहा कि वही सब कुछ है लेकिन उसकी सुनी नहीं जाती है क्यों क्योंकि ताकत जो है वो दूसरे लोगों के पास है जो तादाद में बहुत कम है लेकिन सभी साधनों पर उनका कब्जा है और उन्हीं के पास सब सारी संपत्ति है अधिकांश लेकिन एक दूसरी बात जो आपने कही कि लोग सोशल मीडिया पर कहते हैं ये या और कुछ भी कहते हैं इसमें जो मैंने तय किया कि मैं फेसबुक पर नहीं हूँ मैं टेलीविज़न नहीं देखता हूँ अखबार ज़रूर लेता हूँ कई लेकिन जब देखता हूँ कि उसमें ख़राब बातें हैं तो उसको नीचे रख देता हूँ और जो जूलियन असेंजे या स्नोडन ने कहा था वो बहुत पते की बात है कि ऐसा कुछ भी आप न कहें सोशल मीडिया में या कहीं भी जो आप सार्वजनिक रूप से न कह सकें और ये जो गाली गलौज करने वाले हैं उनका आप कुछ नहीं करेंगे वो बुद्ध ने जो कहा था वही मानिए कि मैंने सुना ही नहीं थैंक यू फॉर वंडरफुल रेंज ऑफ क्वेश्चंस एंड I'm not sure I'll be able to do justice to all of them. Um, I'll group them. I think they're broadly in three categories. Um, the first question was about the connection between the global and the local, both in terms of the intensity, but also what's the conceptual connection, uh, in some ways. So look, I think two things. One is. i think just registering the fact that there is a global crisis of legitimacy and as arun kamal ji said it does behoove sorry i think i should be one way uh it does behoove us 
to ask the question, what is going on in the world, particularly in a world that is globalized, with these systematic interconnections, that this crisis is produced simultaneously across the world, uh, where capital feels the need, in some senses, to, to repress labor, mm -hmm. where the confidence, the confidence that our current economic models can deliver for most of our populations is actually waning. Now, I agree completely that India's place in globalization is very different. Uh, India was one of the biggest beneficiaries of globalization, and I would defend that globalization, I think, any day. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the last 20, 25 years of Indian economic history, all said and done, have been amongst the most promising. You had the sh sharpest drops in poverty, and you also had great expansion of state capacity. And this is a very different story, right? in some senses, from the story in the West of the middle class hollowing out and stagnant wages. But there are still two important commonalities, even though the effects are very different. The first important commonality is what does globalization do to the structure of ideological contention and politics? Part of what made globalization as an ideological phenomenon interesting is that globalization required a kind of domestic consensus and technocratic management of the economy. And this is something you find the world over. More and more aspects of economic life were taken out of democratic control and entrusted to, let's say, independent regulators and agencies, <laughs> sometimes imperfectly. But this sense that the economy is an area that needs to be depoliticized, right? this idea, in mm -hmm. some sense, is an ideological construct was very, very powerful. And consequently, the distinction between different forms of ideological contention over the economy were no longer that significant. I mean, one of the reasons people can easily switch parties is, frankly, there's, there are no ideological differences over the, over the management of the economy. Right? So paradoxically, right, even in places where globalization, you might say, brought benefits, It actually creates the conditions where if you're not now contesting over left, right, if you're not contesting over competing visions of development, what will we contest over? So one but there are still two important commonalities, even though the effects are very different. The first important commonality is what does globalization do to the structure of ideological contention and politics? Part of what made globalization as an ideological phenomenon interesting is that globalization required a kind of domestic consensus and technocratic management of the economy. And this is something you find the world over. More and more aspects of economic life were taken out of democratic control and entrusted to, let's say, independent regulators and agencies, sometimes imperfectly. But the sense that the economy is an area that needs to be depoliticized, right? this idea, in mm -hmm. some sense, is an ideological construct was very, very powerful. And consequently, the distinction between different forms of ideological contention over the economy were no longer that significant. I mean, one of the reasons people can easily switch parties is, frankly, there's, there are no ideological differences over the, over the management of the economy. Right? So paradoxically, right, even in places where globalization, you might say, brought benefits, 
it actually creates the conditions where if you're not now contesting over left, right, if you are not contesting over competing visions of development, what will we contest over? So, one of is that identity actually becomes the only axis on which you can assert difference. Right? The differences in the economic arena are differences over technocratic performance. Who's a better administrator? It is not a difference over competing visions of what the economy might be. So it's one of the unintended but paradoxical consequences of globalization. Right? That today, even today, when you think of the difference between the Congress and the BJP, right, or the Congress and any other party, or the BJP and any other party at the state level, you will think of the identity difference, the Hindutva communal access difference. But on other differences, it will be more a technocratic language of administration. OK, this government was a little bit more effective in implementing X policy. Right? So that's, I think, one I think, I think important feature in the way in which globalization depoliticizes. The second commonality, and I think this is an interesting challenge for India at this moment. And this goes to the OBC question somebody had asked. I'll, I'll answer it in a different way. So if we look at the last 20, 25 years, maybe post-liberalization India, right? as I said, you can tell a slightly optimistic story about two sections. The top 10% and the top 1%, even more than that, have absolutely flourished under the system. No, no question about it, right? That capacity, that growth also translated into more resources for the state so that the state could at least begin to construct much more of a welfare architecture than India ever had. And I don't think one should underestimate actually the degree to which India's welfare architecture has, has, has expanded and become more effective. Right? I mean, you just look at the degree of cash transfers, for example, a state like Andhra is doing. You look at the scale of infrastructure investment, right? The range of things that we are actually doing better, right? Uh, where we are stuck right, in this development model is that classic productivity and increasingly meaningful, dignified, remunerative employment story. The state welfare redistribution channels can fill in some of those gaps. It can do small cash transfers. PDS has, in most states, become better, right? It can do Narega, right? It can do a whole range of those things, right? It can do cooking gas. It can now even do mobility, right? But the middle in India still has this sense of profound uncertainty and stagnation. Graduate unemployment, right? I mean, just to take one little slice of that story, where the state could get you to universities. It can't get you jobs after that, right? And if you look at the one of the challenges, I think, one of the sources of where you'll see Indian politics be unsettled, I think, over the next few years, is Take groups like Patidars and Jats, right? In one classic definition, dominant groups, and yet not very clearly beneficiaries or being able to compete in the new economy, right? So there's this kind of disjuncture between their current status and their future prospects in some ways, right? Then there is that disjuncture which is these groups in some senses, and you can think of the kind of the upper end of the white working class as a kind of analogy, who will also find no easy recognition in the normative frame of Indian democracy. Qua OBCs, right? Dalits 
the state and Indian society has oppressed and cheated Dalits. That, right? But normatively, everybody understands, right? That this is a group that has been targeted uh, on any axis of deprivation and humiliation. The political sociology of that lack or deprivation that Jats or Partidars feel now is very different. How do you actually justify? They are dominant on one dimension and yet not going to be competitive in getting to that secure top 20, 30% in the modern economy on another dimension, right? And which is why you are actually seeing the most, in a sense, unsettled character in these groups in some ways, right? Um, and a certain kind of political agitation, right? Partidars in Gujarat, Jats in Haryana, and, and frankly, the BJP is scared. It will probably lose Haryana, largely on the backs of this, this group, right? And so the question then that raises, and that's the question about the relationship between caste. So of course, caste and class both matter, right? But we are in this interesting conjuncture where the demand that would effectively address the concerns of these groups cannot be articulated in policy terms in caste terms because that is not going to be an instrument to address that concern, right? Reservations, how many jobs will the public sector create, right? And yet the social and political articulation still has to be in caste terms. And so in a sense, there's that kind of deep mismatch in some ways, right? Uh, 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 we know that <laughs> temperature kya hai, but you know, ilaj kya hai is something in some sense is very, very different. So that's, I think, one set of questions on globalization. The second question, set of questions, and, and this was the big one, which I deliberately avoided talking in this lecture, I speak too much about it, was this question of Hindutva and fascism, right? Uh, now, I think here it is important to, in one sense, not exceptionalize the Indian experience. I think India, like the United States, I think two large democracies, one of our failings is we both, both these countries think their democracies are sui generis. You know, largest, oldest, you know, these are very special countries, one founded on immigration, ours is excessively pluralistic, all of that. Okay? One way of thinking about the Hindutva project, right, is that the Hindutva project is trying to create in India a 19th century style European nation state. It has nothing to do with Hindutva or Hinduism, right? Under conditions where the consequences of that project will be catastrophic. And as they were catastrophic in Europe, right? The biggest Achilles heel of liberal democracy if one were to put it very crudely, has been that it has had no theory of membership. Right? We know what rights people should have. We've had no theory of who should count as being part of that people. Now, European nation states went through that extraordinarily horrible, bloody, genocidal process of creation, there isn't a single nation state that in its history has not been majoritarian, exclusionary, if not outright genocidal, right? England expelled the Jews, subordinated the Catholics, you know, once it consolidated, in a sense it becomes liberal late 19th century. If you look at the process of 19th century consolidation of native nation states in Europe, right? What was the premise of that consolidation? Uh, it was Modiji's dream, one everything, one language, right? One common ethnicity, right? right? That process was extraordinarily bloody and exclusionary. In fact, the term genocide in a technical term is actually a product of democracy, right? Where you target a people simply for being who they are because you can't include them in the people, right? Traditional empires, right? Ottoman, Habsburg, Mughal, actually they're hierarchical, but they don't have to, they don't require this concept of the people in the deep sense that a modern democracy requires. 
Now, to be honest, if we were brutally honest about it, this question has been haunting us since 1857, when it became clear that whatever the future of India, right? I mean, one of the remarkable things about India is that as early as 1857, most of the dominant forces are converged on the idea that India is not going to have a traditional monarchy. India is not going to recreate, right? Old empires, the Bourbon, you know, ancient regimes. It is going to be a democracy in some form. And it is democracy that puts on the table, as Kamalji said, the question of majority versus minority as a political category, right? right? Now, I think if you're honest with us, we have to admit two things. One, that the problem of communalism and what makes it such a difficult problem is that it's a problem that arises within democracy. It has anti-democratic implications, right? But, you know, we had 100 year, 50 years of negotiations over power sharing arrangements between Hindus and Muslims. And the honest truth is none of those arrangements was going to be a stable one, right? If you don't give minorities enough veto power, they said, Jinnah said they're not protected enough. If you give them veto power, right, majority thinks it's in a sense being marginalized, right? The, so one question which we did not, never had a political settlement, and we can't, so long as we pose that question in terms of power sharing between majority and minority. Mm -hmm. Congress tried to run Hindu nationalism and Muslim nationalism together. BJP comes and says, in ki kya So in that sense, I think it is, it is, it would be easy for us conceptually if we just said this is anti-democratic. Of course it is, but it is a problem that arises from within the demands of democratic mobilization. Right? The second thing, and this is the counterfactual, I think Hindu nationalism has had much deeper roots in Indian society than we acknowledge. In fact, I think Gandhi's assassination created that illusion for us. Do the counterfactual. What would India have been like in the 1950s had Nathuram Godse not assassinated Gandhi? Would the right-left distinction in Indian politics been so much sharper in the 1950s that actually the institutionalization of Indian democracy might not have worked, even to the degree it did? I mean, Gandhi in his death saved us. It's, 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 the undercurrents were so deep already by the 1930s, 1940s. And it's one of the dualities, I just kind of, in a sense, the last one, which is how do we, in a sense, resolve this conundrum? So, so, and one of the strengths that the BJP draws on, right, is that it has taken that modernist 19th century discourse and transplanted it in a context where it has deeply disturbing and communal implications. Now, I will say this, that at least in my lifetime, we, I have not seen the kind of not just communalization that we are witnessing in India, but it very much feels like the 1930s. And by 1930s, I'm not thinking of 1930s Europe, fascism. That's the easy analogy. It's 1930s India. Congress party in 1930s India this is the party of Nehru and Gandhi, was under the illusion, right, that you could create a cross-party alliance mm -hmm. to at least stave off the worst evils of communism. And we also had this illusion that the solution to this problem rise in the realm of culture, right? Some syncretic culture, Ganga, Janna, Tehjeev, something, right? But within a space of eight to 10 years, that settlement dissipated very badly. I mean, the, you know, partition violence wasn't an accident. And I think we are at that conjuncture where it actually feels very much like that. This prospective confidence people had in the late 30s, 1940s, this is India, this can't happen here. Right? The difference this time, though, is that the elite buy-in, the buy-in of Indian capital, you know, one of the things that worries us about Indian capital is not just that it's supporting the ruling party. Capital always does that in any, in any context. 
it is that Indian capital is becoming an instrument for the subsidization and dissemination of hate. That is on a, at a very different and unprecedented level, right? The Indian middle class, which was perhaps more evenly divided in the 1950s, 60s, right? So Nijikaran, we have the kind Arunji is talking about, but there's also this extraordinary communalization. And we know these stories never end well. I mean, Jawaharlal Nehru has this wonderful letter to, Mo, to Iqbal when they're exchanging notes over the Ahmadiyas, you know, tragic fate, tragic victims of the 20th century. And Jawaharlal Nehru says, writes to Iqbal, he says, whenever culture enters the realm of politics, it will always take a reactionary form. No exceptions. That's the moment we are in right now. Mm -hmm. Problem that arises from within the demands of democratic mobilization. Mm -hmm. right? The second thing, and this is the counterfactual. I think Hindu nationalism has had much deeper roots in Indian society than we acknowledge. Right? In fact, I think Gandhi's assassination created that illusion for us. Do the counterfactual. What would India have been like in the 1950s had Nathuram Godse not assassinated Gandhi? Would the right-left distinction in Indian politics been so much sharper in the 1950s that actually the institutionalization of Indian democracy might not have worked, even to the degree it did? I mean, Gandhi in his death saved us. It's, 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 it's the undercurrents were so deep already by the 1930s, 1940s. And it's one of the dualities, I'll just kind of, in a sense, the last one, which is how do we, in a sense, resolve this conundrum? So, so, and one of the strengths that the BJP draws on, right, is that it has taken that modernist 19th century discourse and transplanted it in a context where it has deeply disturbing and communal implications. Now, I will say this, that at least in my lifetime, we, I have not seen the kind of not just communalization that we are witnessing in India, but it very much feels like the 1930s. And by 1930s, I'm not thinking of 1930s Europe, fascism. That's the easy analogy. It's 1930s India. Congress party in 1930s India, this is the party of Nehru and Gandhi, was under the illusion, right, that you could create a cross-party alliance mm -hmm. to at least stave off the worst evils of communalism. And we also had this illusion that the solution to this problem rise in the realm of culture, right? Some syncretic culture, Ganga, Janna, Tehjeev, something, right? But within a space of eight to 10 years, that settlement dissipated very badly. Partition violence wasn't an accident. And I think we are at that conjuncture where it actually feels very much like that. This prospective confidence people had in the late 30s, 1940s, this is India, this can't happen here. Right? The difference this time, though, is that the elite buy-in, the buy-in of Indian capital, you know, one of the things that worries us about Indian capital is not just that it's supporting the ruling party. Capital always does that in, a, in, in any context. It is that Indian capital is becoming an instrument for the subsidization and dissemination of hate. That is on a, at a very different and unprecedented level, right? The Indian middle class, which was perhaps more evenly divided in the 1950s, 60s. So Nijikaran, we have the kind Arunji is talking about. But there's also this extraordinary communalization. And we know these stories never end well. I mean, Jawaharlal Nehru has this wonderful letter to, Mo, to Iqbal when they're exchanging notes over the Ahmadiyas, you know, tragic fate, tragic victims of the 20th century. And Jawaharlal Nehru said, writes to Iqbal, he says, <laughs> 
whenever culture enters the realm of politics, it will always take a reactionary form. No exceptions. Right? That's the moment we are in right now. Thank you so much, sir. Um, we are actually our time is up for this event and uh, we had an excellent fabulous lecture and also a very engaging session with uh, audience participation both online and offline i'll just be a, give a very brief <coughs> vote of thanks um, and then i would invite all of you to join us over tea we can continue some of these discussions and professor mehta will also be there tomorrow so in in, in case you would like to have a more detailed conversation with him uh, we can always schedule some time uh, <laughs> uh, I would now uh, like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Abdul Hai, uh, Director of Paraf Hospital, uh, to felicitate our uh, speaker to today. I'm so sorry. I just <clears throat> I could not understand why Ashwita made me sit in this chair <laughs> for a surgeon to listen to a talk on. And a talk by someone so eminent and sit beside someone who is a poet and a professor of English. I felt very flat, flattered, actually. But it was wonderful. So even a simple man like me, who has very little idea of politics and economics, could understand, I won't say the whole of this, your talk, but a good part of the talk, sir. It was wonderful. It was very bold. Very bold, I would say. And uh, very, very pinpointing. I mean, you, you weren't... Uh, Running around, you were pinpointing things. We are thankful to you, and I remember uh, Shahbar very much. You know, I wouldn't understand what he would talk about economy and politics, but I think he was a great man, sir, as a friend, as a patient, as a father, and as a husband. I think that man was great, sir. And I today take this opportunity to pay my respect to him, sir. Now it's a uh, on behalf of all of us here, sir, it's my pleasure to... I want to mention one point, sir. Yes, the, a brief profile of Dr. Hai. And it took us really one hour to select what all we leave out uh, to prepare that. He's no, so don't, eminent. Don't embarrass yes. me, please. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I really got carried away after listening to this talk and I was so keen to <laughs> like have further discussions that, um, so this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, please accept this uh, minor goof up. And um, yeah, so coming back to this note of thanks, we have uh, some very eminent people here in our uh, in this audience however uh, for us they are all extended part of our family they have been associated with my father in some way or the other 
And the fact that they are here today seems like a reflection of him being here through them. Um, some of them, so I would particularly like to thank uh, them for being part, <coughs> coming out here. Honorable Shri Nikhil Kumarji, former governor um, of Nagaland and Kerala, uh, Shivanand Trivari ji, I think he had some engagement, so he left. Uh, Tripurari Sharan ji, he has always been uh, very supportive and uh, he's always ready for a good intellectual discussion. He's been, I think, part of all three lectures uh, so far. Deepak Kumar ji, another person who's very uh, intellectually motivated and <clears throat> is very supportive. Raj Vardhan Sharma ji, Professor Shubhash Chandra, Dr. Ravi Shankar, Dr. Satyajit, uh, Professor Prabha Shukla, and also online, um, there were like uh, so many luminous and illustrious people who had joined. Lillian Mutua, she joined from Kenya. Um, Santosh Kumar, who's a professor in Houston. Professor Govind Rao, Anup Mukherjee, Professor Anjan Mukherjee, Professor Chirashri Das Gupta. They not only uh, were part of the lecture today, but they were also uh, very supportive in, uh, in all other uh, memorial lectures from selection of the speakers, to whom we should invite, how we should go about it. So I would really uh, give a special thanks to Professor Mukherjee and Professor Das Gupta for that. Uh, Professor Alak Narayan Sharma, Dr. Kathinka Sinha, Professor Sarthak Bhakchi, and Professor Sonal De Desai. Uh, thanks all of you for joining. Uh, thanks to all our speakers today, Dr. Hai, Dr. Anul Kamal, and uh, of course, uh, Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta for just uh, agreeing to come. I know that his time is very valuable. The fact that he chose to come and deliver this lecture means a lot. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the extended Adri family, those uh, who are in the management as well as faculty staff of Adri for helping me with the logistics uh, and also for providing all kinds of support and also to my mother who was, uh, who was very, very supportive and nagging me all the time, like have you finalized the speakers or not. Uh, so thanks everyone and uh, now we can all go to tea and uh, continue our discussions. So thank you so much.